I shall be reading the NIV version of 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 14 through 23. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendants said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes upon you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, Find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take his harp and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. Children from ages three through grade three is now dismissed, dismissed for kids zone. got to be somebody's kids. It might as well be the pastor's kids. <laughs> in case you had missed um, the voice that was in the background of the video that we uh, showed this morning, that was Michelle, Dick and Judy's daughter, who we thought was going to be here, be able to be with us today, and then uh, some schedules didn't line up, and so she shared that with us, and we thought it was just a beautiful way to include her voice and her presence here, and uh, so um, that was really special, I, I hope for you too. It was, it was special getting to uh, view that earlier this week, and I was in my office, and I thought, I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> And I was the only one in there, so. <laughs> I'm sure this morning is uh, somewhat uncomfortable for the two of you this morning. Uh, Dick asked me this week, what am I supposed to do Sunday morning? Uh, am I supposed to do anything special? And I said, no, just come and, and show up, which I realized for the two of you is something very strange. Uh, because you're often involved and know what's happening, and uh, so I recognize this morning is different uh, for, for the two of you. One of the phrases that uh, some of the great musicians, uh, church musicians of history have used is uh, sola deo gloria, God alone be the glory. And I know and recognize that part of what makes this morning uncomfortable for the two of you is because you have modeled that. It has never been about you. It has been about directing uh, Christ's church towards Christ. And you have been uh, stewards of the church's music, and you have been helping point us to Jesus. And so thank you so much uh, for the way that you have been doing that. Uh, here at Spring Creek, and not just at Spring Creek, but for those many that have been married and buried here, um, your ministry has really touched uh, many through the, these years. 
as we come this morning and talk a little bit more about music and its impact on us, its ministry in the church. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for this precious gift of music. And we thank you so much for those that minister through these ways of sound, of uh, coordinating vibrations, and we thank you so much for the way that it impacts us in very profound ways. As we meet and as we open up your word this morning, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our heart be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever worshipped with a group of people without music? I've maybe worshipped privately on my own without there being audible music, although for me there's always some kind of song going through my head or a tune that I end up whistling or, or something. Even if I'm out in the wilderness walking by myself, music still finds its way there. I've been a part of and led worship services that didn't, we didn't sing, and yet music was still there to create space for us to come and to quiet our hearts and to focus our attention on Christ. So music for me has always been a part of worship. Grandma Alm was a choir director, my mom was a choir director, and so I can't imagine church and worship without music. I went to a uh, Quaker college um, that was its roots, and in Quaker worship you often sit in silence, but there wasn't a lot of sitting in silence for me at college. Worship, uh, music continued to be part of my experience of worship. I can't imagine a world without music. Many ancient cu cultures had mythological stories as to the origins of music. They uh, attribute it to some god or uh, some great event that had happened. Archaeologists and historians debate exactly how old the first instruments are. It's hard for them to tell what one tool might have been used for. But music has been a part of the human experience from the very beginning. Music has been a part of what creates a culture. It's used to tell stories of a culture or a religion. It has related history to be passed down. In ancient societies, it was musicians and minstrels who were the historians who related the history, who were the ancient world's version of the evening news. They let you know what had happened in other towns and in the battle that had been fought, and it was sung. I can uh, attest that music has been a part of telling the story of history. In eighth grade, I had a teacher, Mr. Kilmoyer. And um, <clears throat> there was always a contest. Mr. Kilmoyer was getting near the end of his teaching career. And um, some of us in eighth grade, um, you know, weren't always the model students. And so Mr. Kilmore started uh, uh, a series talking about the, the Constitution, and he wanted to teach us the preamble to the Constitution. And so he used Schoolhouse Rock. You know, some of you remember what Schoolhouse Rock. Youth, young adults, we'll talk later about what Schoolhouse Rock was. Okay, but it was singing the preamble to the Constitution. And we came in, uh, I can't tell you how many days in a row, and he said, all right, did you memorize the preamble to the Constitution. We said, no. Can you show us that video one more time? And I'm pretty sure we had stretched it to two or three weeks in which we had come into Mr. Kilmore's class and said, no, we, we can't remember it. Can you show us the video again? And he would spend 15 minutes setting up the TV, getting the tape to the right place, and show us the video. And we kind of used it as a way of getting out of actually doing work. I called this story this morning, I was talking to Katie about this story, and I said, this is Mr. Kilmoyer's revenge. And she said, what do you mean revenge? I said, I can still sing the preamble <laughs> to the Constitution. It was a 
fly fox, Mr. Kilmoyer. <clears throat> Music has had a long and significant part of the story of God and of God's people. Music has been used to convey the theology of God's people. So music implants that, that our faith, our belief about God deep in our hearts. For the Hebrew people, one of the most significant statements that they recited every day was the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, or the Lord alone. But they didn't just say this. It was sung in worship in the homes. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Hekad. And they sung it and it went deep into their hearts. The Psalms were the hymnal, the, the praise music of Jesus, and included wonderful songs of praise. Some were songs of ascent, they were sung by pilgrims as they came to the temple at those holy days of the year. Some were songs of lament, giving words for God's people to pour out their hearts to God. Other scripture is songs. Mary's Magnificat was sung by the early church to proclaim a new kind of kingdom initiated by Jesus. Philippians 2, 6-11 is a hymn of the early church, revealing the humility of Christ, but also the exaltation of Christ. Music has always stuck in people's heads and driven that faith deep into our hearts. This past week, um, Tuesday, we had the Hershey Parade. <clears throat> and for uh, a little over an hour, the praise team sang two songs. And you think after singing it that many times, I would be done with those songs, but Wednesday morning, I wake up singing, I've got the joy, 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 joy. I've got the joy, joy, joy. And uh, I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. And, and these songs are just going through my head. They stick in our hearts. The hymns and songs of the church have helped plant our beliefs about God and Jesus and the kingdom of heaven deep within us. Music plays other roles in the church. Long before people knew what music therapy was, musicians were called upon to help people work through hard times. Musicians were often thought in ancient cultures to ward off evil spirits, and so they were brought in to keep the evil spirits away. And that maybe is what is happening here at the beginning of this story of Saul. At this point in Saul's story, he has been rejected by God. He hadn't followed God's instructions that were given through Samuel and had tried to do things for his own, in his own way for his own glory. And now, unbeknownst to Saul, David has been anointed as the future king of Israel. And meanwhile, Saul is completely abandoned by Yahweh. An evil spirit is coming and tormenting Saul. I'm not sure that God sends evil spirits or maybe he withdraws his own protection. <coughs> Excuse me. Perhaps this is the writer's way of trying to understand some kind of mental illness that Saul is experiencing. This is how the, servant, the king's servants understand the situation. They understand that this evil spirit is tormenting Saul perhaps as God's judgment against Saul. Either way, they began looking for a musician to come and play and help soothe Saul. Today, we might look at how brain scans change as music is played, as music deeply impacts what's happening in our brain, affecting our mood and our, our uh, outlook on life. We recognize the deep impact that music plays in helping us process the struggles of life no matter what they are. Romans 8 is another um, section of scripture I looked at this week. 
talking about creation groaning in expectation of new creation, talking about how we groan inwardly. In Romans 8, 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. I sometimes wonder if the Spirit's sighs we hear as music. Helping give voice, give space for us to work through emotions that sometimes are too deep for words, whether they're wonderful, joyous emotions that we experience at, at a wedding or a, or a birth, or deep pains that we're working through in a funeral. Music is a gift that helps us to express our thoughts and emotions, can be used to celebrate, to remember, to grieve, or to call the church to action. And ministering to people in the peaks and valleys is an interesting role as a pastor. It's incredibly humbling. It's a privilege to minister to families in the peaks of life, at these marriages, at uh, births, at baptisms, but also in the valleys, at funerals and health problems, emotional or psychological struggles. Dick and Judy, you have been ministering through your music on many of those occasions. Through weddings of many people here. And through funerals. And your music has helped people through those times to rejoice and to celebrate, but also to grieve and to remember. You've provided comfort at funerals. You've helped us prepare for worship and love feast at baptism. You've helped remind the church of its love for Jesus and for others. Thank you for your commitment to ministry of music. I've talked about how music can help plant the theology, our, our faith in God deep in our hearts. Good music with lyrics that help us to recall the deep roots of our faith are essential. Music helps us move through life's highs and lows, giving expression to our joy as well as our grief. It helps us pray when we cannot find the words on our own. The last thing I think that music does, and, and I came across an article this week uh, kind of on accident, I say on accident, I don't believe it was just accident. They talked about one other thing that music does for us. The last thing music does is to provide the soundtrack of a revolution. Now hear me out. Just about every revolution in history has songs that accompany it. Songs that express the values and the goals of that revolution. The Israelites escape Egypt and Moses and Miriam uh, come out of that experience through the Red Sea and they stop and they sing. Mary is told her son will sit on the throne of David and his kingdom will never end and she sings. A slave trader finds the grace of God, and John Newton writes Amazing Grace, which accompanies the abolition movement in England. The civil rights movement is accompanied by African-American spirituals as the soundtrack of their movement. So the kingdom of heaven is something new breaking into the old. It's a different kind of revolution, but it is something new and revolutionary nonetheless. And music helps point us towards the future that God envisions. It helps call God's people to action. And we need music that calls God's people to action. Music has helped to ground us in the faith. Deep 
truths that find their way into our hearts with tunes that we just can't get out of our heads. Music helps call us towards God's future in the kingdom of heaven. Songs that can help call the church toward faithfulness. Music also helps us to express, express emotions of great heights and incredible lows. And so I wonder, as we gather here and celebrate the music that has been a part of our church, how can we nurture those who will continue to help us sing of a rich, deep, and ancient faith in Jesus Christ? How can we foster those who will help provide the continuing soundtrack of the church in our pursuit of Christ's kingdom? How can we call forward gifts to help us express our joy to work through our pain and give voice to our love for God? Dick and Judy have been doing that. We need to call forward others who will continue that tradition to help the church sing its faith, to help the church sing through its, its joy and its grief, to help sing through calling the church to action and to following Jesus the Christ. May it be so. May it be so. Amen. I invite you to